I'm Old Sneelock. Welcome to another episode of Old Sneelock's Workshop. Well, I'm going to see if I can get these boards down off the top of that rack. First thing to do is get things organized and straightened out so I can get them moved out of the way. Then climb up my ladder. Grab a hold of these two by sixes. When I, that's the first thing I'm going to do. I haven't done anything all day, so I'm going to grab a hold of these two two by sixes and use all the fresh energy that I have stored up from two days of not doing anything out here at the workshop to see if I can get this done. My neighbors are wondering what the loud noises are. What's he doing out there? Making all those loud booms. Well, it's nothing dangerous for anybody but me. Okay, last one. Boom! Shelf boards, down we go. All right. That was the thing that I was dreading the most, actually, out, out of the whole process, was getting those two by sixes off the top of the rack because it was so hard putting them up there. I really didn't want to do anything involving moving them. I thought, well, they can just wait until I get ready to do the lean-to. But, when you see an opportunity to make things better, you might as well do it and not procrastinate or hesitate. Because it usually doesn't get any easier the longer the, that you wait. position on leaning on the ladder. Now I brought all, brought all these inside because they had been sitting out, outside through the whole winter. Uh, and I wanted to get them in where they wouldn't get any more weather checked. Plan what I was going to be doing instead of just trying to do everything all at once. Despite the obvious, I'm not trying to do everything all at once. I'm trying to get the thing done at a slow, steady pace. to increase my chances of succeeding. And 
Now that I got them off the top of the rack, I can lower this ladder. There's a huge market for people selling Medicare right now. Medicare Advantage is a major income source because for the longest time I never talked to an insurance agent. Never. I bought insurance uh, life insurance and life insurance I had I've had the same State Farm policy since uh, 1978. After I got married we bought the house we were thinking about having children I said I should have life insurance. Something happens to me you'll be able to get along without uh, income for a little while and life should be good. Well that was just fine. I didn't have any problem at all with State Farm. I stayed with them till this day. And I intend to stay with them all. It's a whole life policy, it's paid up, I'm making money on the thing, so why would I change? But I had insurance through the places that I worked. That was part of the package. After World War II, companies were trying to find anybody to work for them. There was a huge change in the workforce. You ever heard the old song, how you going to get them back on the farm after they've seen Paris? Yeah, well that worked too. because. Men who went to service came home knowing a lot more than they did when they left. And they were much more capable. So you couldn't find somebody who was willing to sweat in the mine as easily, nor could you get somebody to work in a factory unless they were getting paid an awful lot. So, rather than keep increasing the uh, paycheck, companies figured out that they could sell life insurance, or health insurance, and life insurance. They gave you a life insurance policy when you signed up, usually ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, which right after World War II, that was a tremendous chunk of money. They also paid health insurance. It was a good thing for the company. It was a good, great thing for the employees because the employees would go see a doctor occasionally. Now, there are other things that happened that weren't necessarily all good, but it did mean that children got prenatal care. Uh, as time went on, dental work became part of the package. So, people were more healthy, and that was a good thing. But then, as time went on, things changed, as they always do, and companies started seeing that they were paying an awful lot for insurance. I'm not blaming the companies, I'm not blaming the insurance companies. It was a, it was a situation where everybody was looking out for themselves and trying to make 
the best deal they could. And often it meant that people did some pretty dumb things. Then they came out with a thing called cost of living increase. It was supposed to keep everybody's paycheck even with the actual cost of living. And that was seen as a great benefit. Well, problem is, it's like interest on a loan. You get the benefit, but then you have to pay the interest. And the interest for the companies was that no matter what they did, the cost of the insurance kept going up. So the cost of the living went up. Because the local store, and my mom told me this story, and I have checked in many years since she told me. When the foundry went out on strike, they would go out on strike for a nickel, a nickel an hour. Of course, they're getting paid a buck and a quarter an hour. Yep, a buck and a quarter an hour to work the foundry. They go out on strike for a nickel, and the company would just wait and eventually, the union would go back to work for three cents. During the sometimes three months that they were out on strike, August, September, and October, because uh, contract negotiations were in August, and who the heck wants to work in a foundry in August? They just got done with working in July, one of the hottest months of the year. Then they got into August, which was definitely hot, to the point where it was almost enough to make you pass out just standing on the pouring floor. So, getting somebody to go back to work when they got paid strike pay $15 a week yeah $15 a week doesn't sound like much does it well it's not <clears throat> but still they'd rather work side jobs and mow lawns and do other things to make a few extra bucks, refinance the car. You'd see cars parked in a driveway for the entire three months because nobody had any money for gasoline. But you could walk to the corner store and get your six pack for the evening. So, strikes would just carry on three months. And the people with families, like my parents, ended up borrowing money. Or refinancing. Refinancing the house, refinancing the car, refinancing everything that they had to borrow money for. Now, my dad didn't like borrowing money. And it was probably a good thing that he did. And they didn't own a house up until they bought the house on Crippen Street, so they had no mortgage. So it wasn't too bad going on strike. For the first two years after I was born, they lived on Park Avenue, which meant that Dad could walk to work over at the Midwest Foundry right across the street. So he didn't need a car. And when strike time came, he could walk the picket line by just stepping out the front door. 
Well, then they bought the house on Crippen Street. They had a mortgage, but he was still close enough to walk to work. So that's what he did. He walked to the picket line. And they did their best to try and stay up with everything. Not spend money. There's a there's a meal called uh, well I'm not going to tell you what the actual name of it was. It was poop on a poop on a shingle, we'll call it. Chip beef on toast, I guess was the light for it. And we had chip beef on toast quite a bit during those times. Because it was mostly flour water mixed with dried beef. and poured over bread. Not the most wonderful meal in the world, but it sure beat not having anything at all. I think I mentioned one time about having somewhere. Now I'm going to put my hands on it again. <clears throat> or just grab a different so I don't drop this upright on my head.
Okay, I'm going to pick up all the steel components that have fallen off whatever piece of equipment that I had sitting on the shelf. One of the things that I needed to do after I moved the shelf was take out a clamp that had fallen between the sheet metal and the frame of the building. That made it so that I can fasten this sheet metal to the bottom rail of the frame. I have these fastened, but that bar clamp that fell down in between the sheet metal and the frame kept me from tightening up the rest of them. So tomorrow is supposed to be better weather, and I will attempt, after getting the saw out here, because I have to move that saw, miter saw, So I can bring the radial arm saw in and set it where the miter saw is sitting now. But I think I'm going to have to move these boards off the floor before I get too far along on this. time it was important to get out here and get started otherwise I'd never get anything done and there's a lot to be said for that it's easy to get distracted okay get the hand the room and sweep out that corner time tomorrow to put the screws in the bottom of the sheet metal is it's November 5th right now. November 5th is soon followed by very cold weather and snow. Now you can put sheet metal screws in in, in the snow. Won't bother the operation of the sheet metal screw gun. Won't bother the screws. Just bother the operator, because that person will be up to their armpits and cold. Cold and wet. So I would like to avoid that if possible. inside bend over. And it's easy to pick this thing up and lift the things out of it. So, I will 
lift this up, take out the vacuum cleaner nozzle, take out the top flip inside slide mouse trap, take out this piece of stone, take out the bottle cap, and the rest of it gets tossed in the garbage. And I need to get these boards out of here so I don't have to keep doing the balancing that going across the floor. That's a sure way to Let's see, what was I talking about? I was talking about cost of living. Favorite topic of mine, because it's a bait and switch. It sounds like a heck of a deal. As I told you, my mom said something that has stuck with me the whole time. They would go out for a nickel, walk the line for a month up to three months. Go back for a nickel or go back for three cents because that's all the company would offer. Now the company was trying to make a profit. I can't say that they're evil. Most of them were just people trying to make a living. Well, some genius came out with the idea that, well, we're going to do cost of living increases as a bargaining chip. So the insurance and now the cost of living made it so that the average working man could raise a family. I did it for a number of years. But the cost of living meant that each year the federal government made up a statistic that they called the cost of living. Now it wasn't really the cost of living, it was based on indices. What's an indices? Well that's, that's a criteria that they came up with and said, okay, we're going to say cost of living is based on the price of certain items. Now it wasn't always the things that you really needed in life. It wasn't like the electric bill or how much it costs for gas for your car. Because those were things that everybody did. Everybody had to feed their family. And because Jobs got to be more and more diverse. I started out living across the street with my parents from the Midwest Foundry. And I walked to work. I did that for three years. So I was happy. 
happy with that arrangement. But that was in the late 60s, early 70s. Started the foundry in 1969 when I turned 18. So, costs weren't that bad, but there were the costs. The foundry didn't do cost of living. Cost of living didn't start until I started working at Borg Warner. Borg Warner was a great place to work. I will never complain about having to work at Borg Warner. That was a, a really nice company. It was an experiment. Borg Warner was a company that was based in Canada and they made automotive parts. You know, you've seen Borg Warner transmissions and you've heard about various and sundry things that Borg Warner made. Well, Borg Warner made a lot of stuff. Not just automotive things. But, the big thing they were doing in Canada was making radiators. And it was costing them a ton. Because they had a union up in Canada. And the union knew that they had them over the barrel because they had customers they had to, to supply. And if the union went on strike, their contract was better than the one that found it. They wouldn't make anything. So Borg Warner decided that they needed to change the way things are done. So they set up an operation to make radiators and cold wire. And it was, the idea was to not have a union. So they did everything they could to make people happy so they wouldn't want a union. And we did. Life was really nice for They paid us well. We had life insurance and health insurance and all kinds of stuff going for us. Not complaining a bit. But, Ford Warner was losing money hand over fist. Not because we were doing a bad job. They weren't running a very careful business. They had some people there that were making some silly mistakes. Which is unfortunate. Because everybody who worked there loved it. Like I said, we felt like a family. We got paid well, we were treated well, had all kinds of benefits. But we couldn't sell the products that we were making because for some reason they decided that they were just going to have that be an experimental operation. So we were making radiators prototype radiators. Now maybe it was some plan that they had that I didn't know about because I wasn't involved in any of the upper thinking. I was just a guy who fixed the machines. Fixed machines, repaired and made dies and fixtures. Tried to make sure everything was running. Because that's how I got paid. And I knew if I kept everything running and the company made money, that they would keep going. Well, I was wrong. 
I didn't have any real effect on what happened as far as the company made the money. They had set themselves up as a loss leader. So when the time came that it was costing too much to run the business, they were going to close it. Well, I saw the writing on the wall. You can't lose six million dollars a year for much, for very many years. And War Warner was in that unhappy situation. I, did, I said I wasn't involved in any of the upper thinking, but I had a boss who was. And he was a good man. Happy to work for him. He told us what was going on. And I told you before that Borg Warner paid you to go to school. Yeah, that was a good benefit. You wanted to get a college degree as long as it was related to your work. And the relationship could be pretty nebulous. Didn't have to be a solid 100% link up. So I took management class. It was at the local community college, Kellogg Community College. As long as I made things easy, which was surprisingly easy, I never thought of myself as necessarily very smart. But evidently, I was smart enough because I held a four point. Ended up getting trained as a tool maker, machinist, tool maker, electrician, welder. Every tech class that they had, I took. And I also took management classes, which meant that. When I was done, I was going to have a degree in industrial engineering. Which was going to be a pretty good deal for me. to go. And when I talked to my boss about moving into management, he said, well, that's not going to happen, Dave. We're not going to be here long enough. The people that are here as managers or supervisors are looking for other places to be, except for the few that were old enough to retire. They were just hoping the company would stay open long enough they could reach that goal. So I went looking for work elsewhere. But in the meantime, War Warner was paying cost of living increases. Back to that story. And just like when the foundry gave you three cents to go back to work, There was a general store in Coldwater called the A&P, Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. And they were not quite a supermarket, but the beginnings of one. I 
Well, Laundry got a three cent raise. Cost of food went up three cents. When the cost of living went up, as in the cost of food went up, that money was taken up and supporting your family and buying anything that you needed. So the cost of everything went up. Not exactly a winning situation. But the people who bought Warner thought cost of living increase was a pretty good deal. They were very excited to get a cost of living increase. And I said, all you're doing is making it so that the next can of beans you cost, the next can of beans you buy, it's going to cost more. And the cost won't ever go down. So it's always going to cost more to live. And they said, but the cost of living will cover that. And I said, yes, it will, until they decide they don't want to do it anymore. Now try and find a job today we get cost of living increases. Social Security, they still do cost of living increases. McDonald's? Don't think so. Don't, I've never worked at McDonald's, but I'm just imagining that somebody that's working a retail store selling food where you got a very low markup. It's probably not interested in doing a cost of living increase to try and maintain employees. Give you a little bit of information. A gentleman named Jerry, and I forgot his last name. More's the pity, I liked you. When I worked at UTC, he was one of the supervisors running the presses. He worked day shift, I believe, because he was there when I was, which means he must have worked day shift because that's what I did. I was the maintenance manager. That meant I chose what time I worked and I chose I wanted to work at day shift. Well, Jerry, I worked at ATL. ATL was a company that ran a trucking company. They did carried freight from all over the place to other places and uh, he was a supervisor out there. My brother was the supervisor out there. My brother became a manager out there and uh, moved up in the organization pretty quickly. So I imagine Jerry saw it as being a, an advantage getting to know Dave because his brother Jerry was at ATL. Well, ATL was doing quite well and then some genius decided that well, the best thing to do to make things work better is raise the size that a truck could be. For the longest time, it was 40,000 pounds was the max weight that you could have on a truck. 40,000 pounds for over, over the road standard semi. Now, there were certain things that, uh, you know, heavy load equipment, they had a tremendous number of tires on them. One of those was called the train, and that was what the foundry used to haul 
pig iron. Pig iron was very dense and weighed a lot. So the train had 48 tires on it. Yeah, that's a lot of tires. It had a dump bed on the front trailer, and then the pup that followed. That was 80,000 pounds with just two duels on the trailer, and two rear duels on the tractor, and two steer tires. So that was doubling the load. Well, what that did, trucks made deliveries. And one of the things that ATL did was they broke up shipments. Somebody ran a company that made uh, washing machines. And they would load up the truck with washing machines, as many as they could pack in, as long as they stayed under the 40,000 pound limit. And drove them down the road to a brake ship place like ATL. They had a trucking terminal. Out on the east side of Coldwater near I-69. Well, when they raised the weight limit to 80,000 pounds, that meant that they didn't have to have the trucking terminal in Coldwater anymore. They could go all the way down to uh, Angola, where they had another ATL trucking company, or trucking terminal, that's the word, and not have to ship everything and break it up about every 30 miles. They could take the load down there, drop it, break it up, put it on trucks, and they could put 80,000 pounds on the delivery trucks. So the delivery trucks could make deliveries of 80,000 pounds of material. Now, with a longer bed and the higher weight limit, trucking companies I don't know if they made more money or not. Not, a, not understanding trucking companies very well. My brother does, he owns the trucking company, or did. Not sure if he still owns it, or if he sold it. But in any case, he knows a lot more about trucking than I do. Well, that meant that Jerry, remember Jerry, I was talking about Jerry at UTC, managing the day shift press room. He uh, was let go at ATL. Not because he did anything wrong, they just didn't have the trucking company there anymore. The terminal was gone. They turned the terminal into a storage building. And I don't know what actually happened to it. I haven't been down there in a long time. But in any case, Jerry came to United Technologies and became the day shift press supervisor, press room. Well, Jerry being a smart man decided that, well, he wasn't gonna put himself in a position where he was gonna have uh, somebody else telling, me, telling him he was gonna be out of work that day. So he bought the local Dairy Queen and uh, it was down on, let's see, I think they called that Division Street, and that was ran north and south through Coldwater, it was US 27. Forget things after a while. But anyways, he uh, bought the, the business and spent a lot of time, effort, and money on it, building it up, and it ran really well. He hired his daughter to manage it, while he was working at uh, United Technologies and she was running the business and his wife worked there and his kids worked there. And when he got up and running to the point where he could do it, he left United Technologies and went over there to work. But in the meantime, 
In the meantime, while he was learning how to run the business, because he was smart, unlike me, I bought a business and had no idea what I was doing. I did it for two years. First year made money, second year lost it all. I went bankrupt. Now Jerry was smarter than that. They had a college for people who were, uh, I forget what they call it when somebody has a franchise, franchisee. He was a franchisee of the Dairy Queen Company and they wanted him to make money because that way they made money. So they sent him to school, taught him all the ins and outs about business, how to run a Dairy Queen restaurant and be profitable. Well, he would come back to work, and since we had jobs where we were responsible for things, and we were supposed to make sure everything was working good, but as long as things were working good, they didn't care if we talked to each other. Matter of fact, they kind of encouraged it. So, Jerry and I got to be friends. Odd that same name as my brother, but he told me about going to Dairy Queen College. And he told me, and I had every reason to believe him because there was no reason for him to tell me anything different. I mean, it wouldn't, he wouldn't lie about it because there was no point to it. He said he made more money off the cheese on a hamburger than he did off the hamburger itself. The hamburger was such a low price trying to get people to come in and buy the hamburger. They would go in to buy the hamburger and they'd say, you want some cheese on that? Well, yeah, 10 cents. Doubled the profit on the cheeseburger. So, where am I going with this? Cost of living increase. Warg Warner gave me cost of living increases and I noticed that uh, by the time I was all done, I worked there a total of five years. I started out making $3.35 an hour. By the time I was done, I was making $7.50 an hour. Now part of that was because I moved up in the ranks. I got better jobs and because I was going to college and I made good grades, I got a little more authority and a little more uh, responsibility so I got paid more but I never really made a whole lot of money I was always kind of limited I, I could get money but then I noticed that contracts usually had their uh, fiscal years attached. And most fiscal years were based on the annual year. Some companies went with a March or a June or July or August, whatever day suited them. But Borg Warner did their uh, contracts based on the annual year. So in December, we got an increase it's always nice about Christmas time to get some extra money. And it was a cost of living increase to supposedly bring us up to what the cost of living was for us the next year. But it didn't pay us for the cost of living increase that started in January, the previous January, and then gradually increased all the way up until December when we got a, a cost of living increase. On December, on the day that we got the increase, we were getting paid enough that we were equal in buying power. In other words, if a dollar could buy us an egg in January of uh, 1978, then in 1979, in December, we got an increase to make it so that the same amount of hours worked would buy us an egg was no longer a dollar, don't know what the actual dollar figure was, but the money we made per hour, per labor hour, was equal to the same amount 
that we did in January previously. But we didn't get paid any extra for the, for the time in between because the cost of living inc was increasing the whole time. So you see where we're going with this thing. Cost of living increases are not really any great benefit. It's better than a sharp stick in the eye and there's nothing wrong with getting a cost of living increase other than it raised the price of everything that you bought. So that's my long sad story and I'm done getting the floor cleaned up but I got the boards out of the way and I'm getting tired. I've been out here a couple hours. Time for me to Go make supper. If you have any suggestions for new video, questions about today's video, or any of the other videos on the channel, just drop a note in the comments. You know I read them all. Thanks for watching. not to be viewed by anyone under the age of 13 in the U.S. or 16 in the European Union without the express written permission of the parents or the legal guardians of the underage person. Such written permission must be on file at the local government entity in charge of enforcing the rules and regulations established by the FTC. Anyone violating these terms is admitting by default that they hold harmless the owners and operators of this channel. Any and all questions should be addressed to your local branch of the FTC.